And welcome to the Drew Pearson Show. We're coming to you live tonight from Henry's Tavern right here in Plano, Texas, right off of Legacy Road here, and Legacy in the Toll Road, and part of the Shops of Legacy. So we're happy to be here coming to you tonight from Henry's Tavern. We got a great show lined up for you tonight, but before I get into our lineup, let's talk a little bit about that Dallas Cowboy football game from last night as they beat the New York Giants right here at AT&T Stadium in Arlington. A home victory for the Cowboys against the New York Giants. It's the first home victory for the Cowboys in the new stadium since 2009. The Giants were 0-4 and four coming into this game. So the Cowboys uh, ended that negative uh, losing streak with a great performance, a great effort, and that's what I think stood out to me most was the effort of this football team. They came to play, they met the intensity of the evening, Sunday night football, season opener in the New York Giants, and you knew the New York Giants were gonna bring it because they're one of the division's foes from the NFC East, and they certainly did bring it. But you know what, so did the Cowboys, and the reason they were able to get those six turnovers and five by the defense is because of the effort that they gave. It was a tremendous effort and that's what we like to see. It seems like a different attitude with this Dallas Cowboy football team. And that different attitude was displayed last night by every member of the team. It was a total team victory. The special teams did their job. The defense did their job. And the offense certainly did their job as well. So it was a great victory. Going to get into talking about that more uh, with our specialists from the uh, pro football side. Of course, that's Mark Colombo. And he'll be supported by Kelly Webster. And we'll give you a, a sports look of what we feel was the turning points and the big plays in that football game last night against the New York Giants. We also got our car segment. Man, we got a bad Dodge Challenger outside. And you'll show you that a little later. We appreciate Dodge City of McKinney for allowing that Challenger to be part of the Drew Pearson Show. And in our entertainment and food segment, We'll introduce to you our new co-host for the food segment. That's Jen Reed, and she'll let you know what our original co-host and our regular co-host of the entertainment and food segment, Paul Salfin, is doing and why he is not with us tonight. But we do have a special piece coming to you from Paul, wherever he might be, and we'll reveal that to you later. We also have a new segment and part of the Drew Pearson Show. It's the workout performance segment. And this will be done with Ashley Goodman, and she's a workout performance specialist, and she works for the Michael Johnson Performance Center. So we got a great lineup for you tonight. We want to thank our sponsors, Dodge City of McKinney, Best Buy, Lombardo's, and of course, Henry's Tavern, where we're coming to you live tonight for this edition of the Drew Pearson Show. And we're about to start this and get this show on the road because the Drew Pearson Show starts right about now. Welcome back to the Drew Pearson Show. We're here at Henry's Tavern, right here in Plano at the Shops of Legacy, right off of Legacy in a Tollway. If you got time, come on out and join us. It's a tremendous facility. They got great food, great service, and all that going on. Pool tables, shuffleboard, big screen TVs. Man, this is the place to hang out if you want to watch some football and have some good food as well, and catch the Drew Pearson Show here on Monday nights as well. And this is one of the segments we got where we get to talk about the Dallas Cowboys and that great victory they had last night against the dreaded New York Giants. Woo, let me hear it. Yeah, all right. So with me now is Miss Kelly Webster from ESPN Radio fame. Hello, Miss Kelly. Hi, Drew. Welcome for your second season Thank of you. the Drew Pearson Show. Happy to be here. And that big fella over there on the end. That's big Mark Colombo, former Dallas Cowboy offensive tackle. And it's good to see you as well, Mark. How's things going with you? Good. Great to be here, Drew. All right. 
Guys, give me your impression, first of all, of the Cowboys' victory last night. Start with you, Kelly. I love the six turnovers. I love how fast uh, Monty Kiffin and Rod Marinelli's message has soaked into this team. They talk about turnovers all the time. Uh, that's all they think about. And I love that the defense forced five turnovers against this Giants yes. team. Special teams got one on a punt, punt coverage. Uh, but I'm impressed with that. Obviously, plenty of room for improvement. There always is. It was the first game of the season. I don't think this game needs to be style pointed. I think you take the win, and I think you start your preparations for the Kansas City Chiefs. Yeah, and that, Jason Witten made a great comment after the game. You know, he knows what happened last year when he won the opener. They went to Seattle and really got ha the game handed to them. So what he was saying is that they got to stack victories on top of victories and get on a roll. And it doesn't happen at a better time at the beginning of the season. So we'll see if that happens. Mark, what was your impression of the game? You know, I think the Cowboys did what they needed to do. You know, they went out and they got a, a huge win against their biggest rivalry in the NFC East. They sent the message right away. Now, this game should have been won more handily. You know, six turnovers, you have to get more points. But I really like, I like the new attitude on defense. I like offense. I, you know, the rushing, the rushing attack really didn't get going, but you saw them stick with it. And late in the game, you saw those defensive linemen. They no longer had the energy to keep up. And the Cowboys got a few big first downs. So that's something an offensive lineman likes to see. But overall, I'm really impressed with their first performance. You know, I look for big things from the Cowboys this season. Well, you mentioned offensive line. What was your impression of the offensive line? Because they were under much scrutiny throughout this whole preseason. Yeah, the offensive line, I think, really showed up last night. You know, they had... Great protection for Tony Romo. He had all day, you know, a couple touchdown passes. He's back there all day to throw the ball. Um, he, run blocking, uh, they're going to get some help with Brian Waters ne hopefully next week. But he, they, they did what they needed to do. They used their hands well. Ron, young Ron Leary, I thought he stepped up to the plate. Uh, the, the defensive tackles, especially for the New York Giants, they have a lot of depth. They have a, a lot of ability. And Ron Leary did a really good job inside. Travis Frederick was another one. You didn't hear his name called the whole entire game. That's great for an offensive lineman. He set the plate for the old line. He did really, really well. The tackles protected. It was just overall, I thought, a strong offensive line performance. They answered the bell in the first game of the season. And Ke Ms. Kelly, you mentioned the defensive line and uh, Monty Kiffin and Rob Marinelli, what they did. Their philosophy, uh, Rob Marinelli's preaching Sprint to the ball and strip. Sprint to the ball and strip. And they did that, but they wouldn't be able to do that without the play the defensive line. They really stepped up, didn't they? I thought they played amazing. I think before the game, the defensive line was maybe even a bigger concern than the offensive line. There were two guys I'd never even heard of on the roster, Nick Hayden and Leonard Cohen. Sorry, guys. Right. <laughs> I just didn't know who you were. Uh, George Selvey, you know, we'd heard his name a couple of times in the preseason, but certainly not a household name by any stretch. And Selvey comes up with a sack and a fumble recovery. Hayden, Cohen, I thought they both held their own. They had a good game. So the defensive line, I have to say, I was completely impressed. They got some pressure. They only had three sacks total on Eli Manning. But again, you're talking about an offensive line with the Giants, experience, depth. It's not going to be easy to get to that guy, and he can scramble as well. Yeah. Uh, so I, I thought they did a great job, and I know you yeah, talked I, to some of the guys about the strip and take away and get to the ball. Yeah, I have something to add. You know, you know, George Selvey, I thought, did a really good job. He was going up against the, the rookie first-round pick who was playing right tackle for an injured David Deal, Justin Pugh, and, and Selvey, was, he was in the backfield. He was getting off on the snap count. He was doing a really good job because on the other side of the ball, you have DeMarcus Ware, and he gets all the attention. Running back chips. They'll throw a tight end over there. They'll try and knock him off his game. Now, DeMarcus had a strong performance, but if it wasn't for guys like Selvey and Jason Hatcher getting penetration up the middle on the other side of the ball, you know, it, it, makes, it makes for a tougher day for Manning. And I think in the end, that extra pressure that you're not getting just from DeMarcus Ware with Anthony, Anthony Spencer being out, you know, really was the difference for the defensive line. Yeah, I think one of the big things about this game was the emotional level that this team played with, the intensity. They stepped up. New York Giants, season opener, national TV, NBC, and all that, and they met that emotional level. 
the way they played, every time the Giants, they scored, the Giants would come back. It's like when they got punched, they punched back. Now, last year, I don't think they would have punched back. But I think this team has a different mindset, different mental attitude, a different mental toughness. So when they do get punched, they will punch back. And I think that was a big reason, the effort that they showed last night is the reason they won that football game. But it wasn't perfect, as you mentioned, Ms. Kelly. What do you see they need to do to improve? Let's start with the offensive side first. Well, I, I definitely agree with Mark. I, I wasn't totally blown away by the running game. I was glad that they stuck with it, especially toward the end. You could see the defense for the Giants. Hands on hips, breathing a little bit heavy. Um, it bought them. They could, you know, run out the clock some more. Um, DeMarco Murray had 20 carries. Even he wasn't that thrilled with his performance. When I talked to him in the locker room, I had to remind him that they actually won the game. Yeah. <laughs> they just seemed really, you know, sort of serious and down. And so I, I would like to see something more from the run game. I would have liked to have seen some passes down the field, maybe trying for a big play. Tony Romo did say he took what the defense gave him, which is probably good news because there are times when he tries to do too much, but he took those intermediate routes that he was given and they just sort of chipped away at the yardage. So I, I wouldn't mind seeing some big plays down the field either. Right on. Well, Mark, what do you think that needs to, they need to prove on and try to get better and get ready in a short week of preparation for Kansas City? Yeah, Kansas City, they're, they're a tough run-stopping team. They play a 3-4 defense. They really need to get in there and, and really get this running game going early. You know, they stuck with it. I'm, I'm really happy with them sticking with this run game, getting it going early. Uh, I mean, getting it going late. But it, it's something that has to start right off the bat. It'll make Tony Romo a better, a, a better thrower. You know, give him a chance to make that play-action pass downfield early. He didn't get a chance to do that in the game. I'd like to see him take a few more shots. I thought early on I saw Des Bryant a couple times in one-on-one -on -one coverage. Now that changed yeah. as the game went on. Yeah. Double covered, even triple covered. That's why you see a guy like Jason Witten so effective. You put him one-on-one -on -one with the linebacker, and it, he's unstoppable. Right. And J he did his job. Miles Austin was one-on-one. -on -one. He did his job also. But I, yeah, even with Des Bryant, get the ball to him somehow, some way, especially when it's one-on-one. -on -one. I'd like to see a few more shots uh, on the defensive side of the ball. The defensive backs have to step up. They cannot get beat with the big play. You know, Monty Kiffin, it's a Tampa 2-style defense, a bend-don't-break. The number one thing, even before turnovers, is you do not get beat deep. And the Cowboys got beat deep a couple times, and that's just unacceptable. That's old Cowboy football. Hopefully uh, that'll change. And believe me, they're getting taught. They know their mistakes. It's still a new defense, defensive scheme. I heard Brandon Carr earlier today talking. They're still getting used to this scheme. Um, it's, it might take a few more games, but, you know, they, they really need to step up because that, that type of stuff shouldn't happen. Yeah, you know, I uh, also agree with you on that. The defensive backs got to be a little more aggressive. They can't give up those big plays. The Giants had three wide receivers with over 100 yards. That's just too much. If you give up 450 passing yards, that's just too much. So that we need to improve in that area for sure. And the way to do that is for your DBs to get a little more aggressive, your safeties be a little more concerned with the pass as opposed to the run. Have a little confidence that those linebackers will step up and make those tackles at the line of scrimmage or five yards downfield. But you got to protect the back end of that defense, and I don't think they did. Uh, speaking of Dez, you know, Dez has got to know that now he's the man, and he's going to get double covered. I got double covered back in the day, starting in my rookie year, because now I'm coming on, now the defense is paying attention to me. So you gotta step up your game to try to deal with that level of attention that you're getting. Uh, Michael Irvin was the same way. Don't you think he was double covered? Most of his career, Jerry Rice, all these great receivers. So, but you can beat the double coverage, but you gotta work a little harder. I think this game was a lesson for Dez and I think he handled himself well as far as not getting frustrated. Sure, he got frustrated when he turned his ankle, and I like to see that because he's into the game, and he brings that type of emotion to the team. But he didn't get frustrated. He didn't start uh, begging for the football or that. He just stayed within the flow of the offense and the flow of the game, right? Absolutely. I was curious, uh, what did you see offensively that you feel like maybe you'd like to see against the Chiefs? Uh, I like to see a little more running game. I need a little more attention to that. But, you know, as Garrett said in his post-game comments and in his press conference today, 
the, the game, the flow of the game time, sometimes dictates how many times you run the football or even how many times you throw the football. So we'll see what Kansas City does. But I think they should have confidence going in now that they know DeMarco Murray coming off that knee injury looks like DeMarco Murray again. You see the quickness, the swiftiness, and all that that he's playing with. And uh, they have to be confident that with their passing game and the receivers they have and with Jason Witten in the middle, they can always rely on that and come back to that if they need to, right? Yeah. So what do you guys think about Kansas City? Can we beat them? Oh, oh yeah, I, that, for sure, for sure. But all right. I, I want to go back to DeMarco Murray. The play that he made on the interception, oh, hustling yeah. Big from play. it was yeah. one of – I was, I was in the box with uh, Babe Laufenberg was really excited with this play. And we talked about his hustle being able, it, it basically saved the Cowboys four points. And you see, if it wasn't for kind of a freak interception at the late in the game where the running back doesn't turn around, I mean, that right. could have been the difference in the ball game. So that hustle, that's, that's really impressive. And I'm a hustle guy. And that, that gave me goosebumps watching what he did and how he went down the field and said, I'm not going to give up. And I think that's Jason Garrett. I think that's the new attitude of this football team. And it's good to see DeMarco Murray out there really having success. And that play may impress me the most this year. He's going to really, he's going to really have to step it up after that one. Well, that's what I'm saying about the attitude and effort of this football team. It's totally different in the past. And I think this is where Jason Garrett was trying to, what he was trying to build within his football team, within his football team. And it looks like they're paying attention to detail and giving that effort. So they should have a good run, you know, down the road. But they got to remain consistent and not get full of themselves and not take this one victory as a Super Bowl victory, but just one victory in the way, in the steps to get to the Super Bowl. So hopefully they'll be able to continue that. I think that this win was a great building block toward the next game. Right. Not to them thinking that they're great, not to them thinking that they're going to go to the playoffs or the Super Bowl. But you really get the sense that it's so cliche, but they are taking it one game at a time. Their focus is just now on the Chiefs. But I think all those messages that the coaches were trying to get through to the players, yeah. I think this was an important win. And I think that message is clearer. I think it's sunk in a little bit deeper. I don't see any reason why they can't beat the Chiefs. I don't either. You know, I think eight and eight in two consecutive years, and you got the leaders of your team. They were knocking on the door to playoffs. I think these guys are now in a position that they want to kick that door in and get in the playoffs and hopefully have a chance for the Super Bowl. One final thing. Jason Garrett is 1-0, 1-0 oh, <laughs> as a walk-around head coach. I told you guys way back he should have gave up that offensive coordinator duties a long time ago. <laughs> and now he's undefeated as a walk-around head coach. What do you think of his performance as a head coach? I love it. I, I, I love his new – it's almost like a new attitude this year. Yeah. He's having fun with it. The guys are really buying in. And it, it's a lot less stress on game day. He can just go be that head coach, walk around to the defense, walk around to the offense. He doesn't have that sh added stress of having to call every play and be perfect. We're seeing, you know, a really good coach in the making this year in Jason Garrett. And even he said today, as the walk-around head coach – leaving the play calling to Bill Callahan, he was able to focus on other things in the game, game management, watching what was being called, providing suggestions. That would not have been possible. He would have been so wrapped up in what's coming up. What do I need to do right now? I can't talk about that right now. You'll have to deal with it. Right. He's able to stay focused on the big picture of getting the win and what needs to happen for that to take place. I think I should have gotten you a sign that's lit up that says, I told you so. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> well, I think he did a good job. And as I said, he's one and zero as a walk around head coach of the Dallas Cowboys. So anyway, it's a great game for the Dallas Cowboys. I appreciate talking sports and rehashing that game with the great Mark Colombo and also the equally great Miss Kelly Webster. Thank you. And the Drew Pearson show will continue right after this. Hi, this is Michael Nass with the Drew Pearson Show. Tonight, our Dodge City of McKinney featured vehicle is the head-turning beast Dodge Challenger SRT8. This is a jazz blue pearl coat color with dual center stripes. It has a functional hood scoop and 21st century HID headlights. It's powered by a 470 horsepower, 6.4 liter Hemi V8. That can get you from zero to 60 in four seconds. This Challenger is outfitted with 20-inch black vapor chrome wheels, Rembro brakes, dual rear exhaust. The interior is appointed with leather seats with cloth inserts, 
leather wrapped steering wheel with paddle transmission shifters and mounted stereo controls. The driver information center contains a Uconnect 6.5 inch touchscreen with Garmin navigation, voice recognition, and Bluetooth. The sound system is powered by Harman Kardon 18 speaker sound system with a one year complimentary series satellite radio subscription. Check out this vehicle and all the amazing inventory at DodgeCityMcKinney.net, home of the exclusive lifetime powertrain warranty. All right, welcome back to the Drew Pearson Show. Man, what a great car, that Dodge Challenger. We want to thank Dodge City of McKinney for allowing that beautiful Dodge Challenger to be part of the Drew Pearson Show tonight. And I can't wait to put my foot on the gas of that baby. What a beautiful car. But now we're going into one of my uh, favorite segments, the entertainment segment. Usually our entertainment guru, Paul Southen, is sitting here with me. But you could tell that's not Paul. <laughs> Our new co-host for the entertainment segment, Jen Reed, and she's uh, being uh, anointed tonight in her first segment of Drew Pearson Show. So, Jen, welcome to the Drew Pearson Show, and tell us where Paul is and what he's up to. Paul is actually interviewing amazing talent. It's Joe Swanberg. He actually has an amazing interview for us, so take it over to Paul. Hi, we're here at Deep Ellen Brewing Company with the one and only Joe Swanberg in town Cheers for the Oak Cliff. Film Festival. This is really exciting for drinking buddies. We're happy to have you here. Happy to be drinking. Yes, so me too. Welcome to, <laughs> <laughs> welcome to Dallas. Believe me, it was like, uh, I feel like an evil genius. I'm like, my master plan has come true. I get to <laughs> made a movie set in a brewery and I get to travel around and drink. Um, but yeah, it's been really fun. You know, I, I, uh, I'm a home brewer and a huge beer geek, so it was, my, it was really my dream that uh, I could travel around and be in places like the Deep Ellum Brewery talking about the movie yeah and and on set you get to I'm, I'm already sad that my next movie won't be a beer movie <laughs> like if, how could I turn this into an entire career you just need you just need beer sponsors and insist that all your interviews be yes. done on insist that all my employees and all my movies work at breweries <laughs> I saw the, and this movie looked like it was a lot of fun there's a lot of beer to be drank on set. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Yes. But there was there was fake beer first, right? Well, we tried. I mean, Drinking Buddies was funny because obviously the actors came knowing that it was called Drinking Buddies and set in a brewery, but, uh, you know, for various reasons it was important for us to give everybody the option to drink fa fake beer. Uh, but yeah, it took about one hour before all the actors were like, ugh, this fake beer tastes gross. We have to... Uh, we have to drink the real stuff. Plus, we were shooting at, at Revolution Brewery in Chicago, which is making great beer. So it was, you know, I mean, this very easy uh, shooting and working environment. But what is fake beer even made of? I I don't know. I have not looked. It wasn't into your, your I have not looked into the science of, of fake beer. Um, no, we we thankfully switched to the real stuff. But but does that make it hard after multiple takes? I mean, you know, it they, a tipsy you know, they're, so. yes, they're they're pros. It was the, the beer consumption was was limited to just scene work and, uh, but yeah, it was really great. I mean, I I remember talking to Jake Johnson before we before we started making the movie back when we were just sort of brainstorming ideas and talking about doing it, and I was like, it's gonna be a really fun movie. It's gonna be the kind of movie where you just like during the lunch break you can drink beer, you can invite your wife and and family to set if they want to come by it's going to be very open and fun and he was like eh, that sounds pretty good um and then i thankfully i could live up to that promise that i made him um but yeah it was cool they weren't necessarily like that's beer knowledgeable before the movie so that was one of the fun things for me was to like the first thing that i did with with olivia wilde and jake johnson when they got to town was bring them to my house and and homebrew with them just so they could kind of see all the stages of the process, what goes into beer. And then the next day we went to Three Floyds, which is a great brewery just outside of Chicago. And uh, my friend Andrew, who's been my friend since high school, is a brewer at Three Floyds. And uh, he showed them around and sort of taught them about brewing and all this stuff. You know, I mean, it was a really fun kind of education process. My hope is that, like, post-movie they think about the beer that they drink now. You know, before they like pick up a macro brew and not think about it, they're like, oh, is there like a local option that I could drink? Is there like some cool craft beer around that I could have? Nice. This is part of my, part of my uh, 
goal to educate the world that there's good beer to be had out there if See? they if they were willing to look for it. They provided a great service <laughs> <laughs> in addition to making a great film. And this this looked like it was a lot of fun to make too. It was very fun. To, it's the most fun I've ever had making a movie. And I've made a lot of movies at this point. Um, it was the the atmosphere on set was really great. I mean, all the actors were there because they wanted to be there. You know, I mean, these are these are movie stars. You know, I mean, they have their choice of jobs that they want to take, and um, it was really a pleasure that they chose Drinking Buddies as a movie they wanted to do. And they came, you know, they came wanting to have that experience. The movies improvised. You know, I mean, it was just a different kind of production, but. Uh, they were so great and fun to work with. I really, I had the best time that I've ever had. Yeah. I was so excited to wake up every morning and I was like, oh, I get to go to work today. This is so fun. <laughs> like, I'm just gonna like hang out with cool people and we're gonna make a fun movie and drink beer. Like that's, that was a great way to spend a month. That's awesome. <laughs>
um, such as contrasting hot cold tubs um, and making sure that they're getting flexibility work in and mobility work in. And so um, what I'm bringing the fans, um, parents and athletes, is I'm going to be talking to professional athletes um, and, and talking ab about their actual training um, routine um, and what they feel has been a big factor at getting them to that level um, and maintaining, maintaining that. Now, do you deal with all professional athletes, uh, football, basketball, baseball, track? Exactly. So we don't just eliminate. We're not just one type of um, coach. We deal with all, all, all levels and all, all athletes. So this is taking their training regime, whatever they do, to stay in shape to another level. To another level. And this is, it, you know, um, I get a lot of questions from parents and from athletes. What do I need to be doing? And so for this, I'm bringing the action right, right, right here. And so um, a lot of the questions that I hear every day, um, I can be kind of like that translator um, from um, athlete to, to viewer. So you look like you're in pretty good shape yourself. Who <laughs> trains you? You train yourself? Well, I train myself, <laughs> yes, but um, I've been training since, since high school so, and playing volleyball and everything. So, um, you know, it's a passion of mine. I love it. Um, but, you know, I, I want to I bring that education out to the public. Right on. So we're looking forward to this special segment of the Drew Pearson Show from Ashley Good Goodman and a performance specialist at the Michael Johnson Performance Center. And uh, maybe you can get me in shape, huh? Yeah, I'll, I'll get All at right. that. <laughs> All right, don't bust me now. We'll be back with more of the Drew Pearson Show right after this. Thank All you, right. Ashley. Thanks. All right, the Drew Pearson Show is coming to you tonight from Henry's Tavern right here in Plano at the Shops of Legacy. And now, you know, I always say this, every segment is one of my favorite segments, but this really is one of my favorite segments. I'd like to welcome to the set our social media director, Michael Nass. And he's been following the Drew Pearson Show tonight live on YouTube with a lot of you, and also been taking your questions via Facebook and Twitter for you to ask me live tonight right here on the Drew Pearson Show. Mike? Did you get anything good tonight? Oh, yeah. We've got a few questions about the Cowboys, especially after last night's performance. Uh, Jay Schmidow on Twitter asks, how should Ch Des Bryant change his approach, if at all, when facing double teams? Well, what he needs to do is first of all, recognize that they're going to be double teams. He's going to be double team. He is the guy now. So if he's the guy in the offense, defensive coordinators are going to be making adjustments and paying a special attention to him. He's going to be the guy that they're going to take away in the passing game and say, hey, let Jason Witten beat us. Yeah, they, that was good last night, right? And then let's say, hey, let Miles Austin beat us. You know, but what Dez has got to do is recognize the double teams, first of all, and then work harder to beat the double team. What he's got to do is make Romo still have confidence in him despite Romo reading the double coverage. He's got to have confidence that Dez will still beat that double coverage and get open so we can get the ball to him. Great. Uh, next question is, comes from two people, actually. Uh, True Blue Nation, I'm sorry, Ulysses says, Ulysses Jackson on Twitter asks, how about the 4-3 defense and the way it played last night? Does it look like we may go far in the playoffs? And Gary Jordan follows that up with, could this current defense be a new doomsday? <laughs> I don't know about that. That's a lot, of, a lot to take on. I don't want to put that much pressure on Monty Kiffin and these guys out there. But the defense has improved. You saw that with the uh, six turnovers, five created by the defense, and two taken back for touchdowns. So that was big that they scored, not only got the turnovers, but they scored. But where I see concern is up front. You know, the defensive line, can they continue to play like they did last night? I like to play the linebackers. Sean Lee and Bruce Carter really had great games last night. But most of all, what I like about the defense is the attitude. You know, because the guys know what they got to do. You know, their assignments is not all complicated stuff. It's not a lot of players uh, moving in and out of the defense. So now they grasp the defense. So now their talent and their ability can take over. And you see that we have some talented guys on that defense. So I don't know if this defense is ever going to be a doomsday defense, but I think a defense eventually will be good enough for a playoff team-type defense. 
get some Super Bowls under their belt, and then we can talk about that. Amen. All right. Amen. All right. Well, final question comes from True Blue Nation on Twitter. Uh, do you think there is a Dallas Cowboy player bias when it comes to Hall of Fame voting? Oh, absolutely. I'm not in it, right? <laughs> Got to be a bias. If it wasn't a bias, I'd be in it. I'd be having to be wearing that ugly yellow jacket right now. But I think there is a bias. You know, sometimes these uh, Hall of Fame sports writers that have the vote, you know, they, they see those things. They say, well, there's too many Dallas Cowboys been in lately and that type of thing. There's too many wide receivers in there right now. Uh, we got to spread it around and that type of thing. So there's no real criteria what to base those votes on. And so uh, I think that the ones that have been left out more than anybody, the Dallas Cowboys, for instance, the all-decade team for the 1970s. All those members of that all-decade team, the first team, are in the Hall of Fame except four guys. And three of those are Dallas Cowboys. Cliff Harris, free safety on defense, Harvey Martin, defensive end, and myself, Drew Pearson, wide receiver. The other guy is Oakland Raiders punter, Ray Guy. So uh, with that in mind, you know, you would have to say there is some type of prejudice. So all you out there, get your letters going, send it to the Hall of Fame, and try to get more Dallas Cowboys in that NFL Football Hall of Fame. So what else you got? That it? That's it. Just remember, follow the Drew Pearson Show on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and Google+. All right, that's Michael Nass, our social media director, and we'll have more of the Drew Pearson Show right after this.